Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Benjamin, and I will be your host for tonight's adult Bible class. I would like to welcome you to the first part of UECM's online class, Call to Missions, Bible and History. And just some quick reminders, please refrain from doing any audio or video recordings. Our technical team will be recording all our sessions and will be uploading them in our church YouTube channel so you can access them anytime you want to. The last 15 to 30 minutes of the class will be allotted for your comments and questions. Everyone is encouraged to post them on our YouTube comment box. Our speakers will try their best to answer our questions to the best of their abilities. And before we start, I would like to request our brother, uh, Toninia, to give us an opening prayer. Okay, let's uh, pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity to have Dr. Joel Williams and Mrs. Rebecca Williams with us to share your word on missions. Bless the speakers, Lord. May the Holy Spirit inspire them to be channels of blessings to others. Lord, as you speak through them, open our ears so that we may hear your voice. Open our minds so that we may receive your eternal wisdom. We pray that you would deepen our comprehension, broaden our thinking, and transform our lives on what we are about to hear. For you are our wise counselor, our perfect teacher, and our faithful friend. We ask all this in the glorious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I would like to give a brief introduction of our speakers for tonight, Dr. Joel and Mrs. Rebecca Williams are in their fourth year of teaching at the Bab Biblical Seminary of the Philippines. Dr. Williams teaches New Testament and theology classes, while Mrs. Williams teaches English. Because of the pandemic, they are currently teaching their online classes from the United States. They have three adult children. Their two oldest children both had weddings during this COVID lockdown. They want everyone to know that they really miss UEC Malabon. Without further ado, let us please welcome Dr. Joel and Mrs. Rebecca Williams. Well, hello. It's wonderful to be here. And we're just really grateful to have a chance to, uh, to speak with you and to be a part of things at UEC Malabon. We will normally try to... Um, make sure that we both have an opportunity to speak. So I will start and then Rebecca will teach as well. So if you just give us one second to switch seats a little bit uh, and then we will get started. It's really wonderful to be here with you. Like we said, we really miss being uh, in the Philippines. We miss being with our students at BSOP, we enjoy being with them so much and we miss teaching with them face to face. In addition, we, we miss being together with you at church at UEC Malibone. I'm sure you feel that same way as well, that you really do miss being together. And we pray that the Lord will put all this pandemic behind us so that we can be together once again. Now we really are grateful that we have a chance to be able to continue to study God's word together through the opportunities and ways that God has provided for us. So we are really grateful to be here with you and to share God's word with you and to think a little bit more about God's plan for the whole world. Well, here we are at the beginning of September. So the very first thing that I need to do um, is I need to wish you a Merry Christmas. So that's kind of the first step. Uh, we always think when we get to the Burr months and we get to September, it's time to start thinking about Christmas. 
And that's one of the things that we miss about the Philippines is all of the Christmas decorations go up about this time. So Merry Christmas to you. And we look forward to this Christmas season. And then I also understand that September is the missions month at UEC Malibone. So happy missions month as well. Uh, we are grateful to have a chance to think together about God's love for the whole world and the message of God's good news that can be spread throughout the world. And it's a great idea that UEC Malibone sets aside a month to think about what God's plan is for the whole world. As we have this month together, and we have four sessions uh, during the month of September, my wife and I both have a part in talking about missions. My part is to talk about what does the Bible say about missions, especially the New Testament. What does the New Testament teach us about the subject of missions? And then my wife Rebecca's part is to talk about the history of missions. What can we learn about missions from the history of the church and how missions has been done throughout church history? Let me start by pointing out that the New Testament is, in fact, a missionary book. In other words, when we, when we study about missions in the New Testament, we're not just coming to a subject that's unrelated to the New Testament. No, actually, we're looking at a subject that's very integral to the New Testament itself, because the New Testament is a missionary book. When you think about it, the New Testament came into existence in a missionary context. The writers of the New Testament were missionaries for the most part. I mean, the Apostle Paul and Luke and John and Peter, these were all people who were actively involved in missionary work, spreading the message of the gospel and planting churches in places where the gospel had not been known. In addition, the people that received the books of the New Testament were people who had very recently come to know Jesus Christ through the work of missionaries. I mean, the people that received the book of Ephesians or received the book of uh, Philippians, these are people that could remember when the missionaries came and shared the gospel with them and helped started the church that they now belong to. Uh, they came to Jesus Christ within a missionary context. In addition, as I say here on the PowerPoint, the New Testament is a missionary book because it contains a missionary message. The, the whole story of the New Testament is a missionary story. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that anyone who believes in him might find life, not just life here and now, but life for all eternity with God. And someday God is going to gather together people from every tribe and language and nation to praise him for all eternity. That's a missionary story. And the New Testament has a missionary story. The New Testament wouldn't exist except for the fact that God loves the whole world and wants to reach the world. So the New Testament's a missionary book, and it's totally appropriate to try to examine the New Testament and what it says about missions. And that can help us to think about well, what does all this mean for us today? Because God still loves the world today, and we still have a part in making disciples among all the nations. Now, there's four, uh, there's four Saturdays, four weeks in September, my job is to talk about uh, missions in the New Testament. And so this week, I will talk about the missionary message of the Gospels, especially the Gospel of Matthew, which I'll emphasize. Next week, I'll talk about the missionary message of Acts. And then we'll spend a week talking about the Apostle Paul. He really is the uh, exemplary missionary of the New Testament. So from his life and from his letters, what can we understand about missions? And then finally, um, the book of Revelation is the great conclusion uh, to the New Testament. And what does it say about missions and God's love 
for all the nations. Uh, this week, though, is about the Gospels. And as we look at the Gospels, I want to look at what I would call a central passage on missions in the Gospels. And that's Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. That's a passage that's often referred to as the Great Commission. The Great Commission. Jesus, right at the end of Matthew's Gospel, gives his people a great task, a commission that he wants us to accomplish before the end of the age. Now, why don't we read through this passage? And then I want to give you four different observations about it. All right, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. That's a very familiar passage. And I'm, a, I'm guessing that you have looked at this passage and thought about it a number of times. But I want to point out four observations, four important ideas that can help us to understand something more about the missionary message of the New Testament. The first two of these observations involve how the Great Commission fits within Matthew's gospel as a whole. In other words, what's important about this passage in light of Matthew's gospel in its entirety? And then my last two observations are more directly related to specific details right in this particular passage itself. So four observations about the Great Commission. The first two related to how it fits in Matthew's gospel as a whole, and the second two observations related to details in this passage. Number one, number one, the Great Commission is not a surprise ending. When you read through Matthew's gospel and you come to the end of Matthew's gospel, it's not like you're surprised by the fact that Jesus calls on his disciples and his followers to make disciples of all the nations. In fact, there's a number of ways in which the Great Commission is foreshadowed in Matthew's Gospel. One of them is that throughout Matthew's Gospel, you can see Gentiles responding to Jesus with faith. But this is right from the beginning of Matthew's Gospel. I mean, just think about it. Right at the beginning of Matthew's gospel, who comes to visit Jesus? It's the wise men from the east. I mean, they're from outside the land of Israel. They're Gentiles. And they, they come to um, Jerusalem and they say, where is he who is born king of the Jews? We've seen his star and we've come to worship him. They recognize that Jesus is, in fact, the king of the Jews, but they're Gentiles. And they want to worship him, too. Gentiles, people of faith, they can follow Jesus as well. He can be their king too. Uh, that's not the end of it. I mean, in Matthew's gospel, you have a centurion, uh, a Gentile who comes to Jesus to ask him to heal his servant. And Jesus recognizes that he has great faith and commends him for his faith. Or there's the Canaanite woman who comes to Jesus in faith and asks him to deliver her demon-possessed daughter. Uh, she recognizes that just a crumb, just a crumb of God's grace through Christ is sufficient to meet her need. There's even the centurion at the cross who recognizes that Jesus is, in fact, the Son of God. Of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Matthew's Gospel is probably the most Jewish of all the four Gospels. But still, there are Gentiles who come to faith, and, and Matthew recognizes that. But the, the fact that the message is for the Gentiles as well as the Jews, that shows up in the other Gospels as well. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is upset about the way things are going at the temple because he says it should be a house of prayer for all the nations. 
I mean, Jesus cares about all the nations that they might have a chance to worship the one true God. In Luke's gospel, Jesus talks about how people will come from the east and the west and the north and the south to celebrate in the kingdom of God, along with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets. John's gospel talks about how there's other sheep, that is, Gentiles, who need to know the message and will be welcomed into the flock so that there might be one flock with one shepherd, one flock, including both Jews and Gentiles. God has always had a plan to include the Gentiles in his kingdom and to have Jesus be a Messiah for all the world. There's no surprises here, right? That's not a surprise. God loves the whole world. In addition, as I say on the, on the uh, screen here, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus prepared the disciples to carry on his work. It's not a surprise that Jesus would give his disciples a task. All along, he's been preparing them to be fishers of men, gave them short-term mission trips in order to train them. Uh, he always has wanted them to carry on his ministry and to carry on his message to the world. He wants them to be his apostles. Apostles mean sent ones. A missionary is someone who is sent. He's been preparing them to be missionaries to the world. And then finally, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus promised that the gospel would be preached in the whole world. This shows up in the other gospels as well. But in Matthew's gospel, Jesus says that the gospel would be claimed in the whole world to all the nations before the end of the age. Jesus wants to prepare his followers to share the message about him to the whole world. Why? Because God cares about the whole world. God cares about the nations. So this is not a surprise ending. Uh, the story has been heading in this direction the entire time. Now here's another observation about how uh, the Great Commission fits in with Matthew's gospel as a whole. And this observation is this, number two here, the Great Commission builds on the Great Commandment. Earlier in Matthew's gospel, a scribe came to Jesus and asked him what the greatest commandment is. And here is Jesus' answer. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two commandments hang the whole law and prophets. The Great Commission follows after and builds on the Great Commandment. And really, the Great Commission really makes sense because of the Great Commandment. When we really love God, we want other people to know God. I mean, we love him. And, and when we recognize that God loves others besides us, we care about our neighbor. And we want to share with them the message about Jesus Christ so that they can know that they have a messianic king as well. The reality is, is that most of us have come to faith in Jesus Christ and have decided to become part of God's kingdom because there was someone who who loved us into the kingdom. They didn't just share the message of Jesus with us, but they loved us too. We saw in their lives that they really knew and loved God. We knew that they cared. And when they shared the message of Jesus with us, we trusted that what they had to say was true. And we put our faith in Jesus. Uh, it wasn't just that we heard the message. Someone loved us and cared about us and loved God enough to tell us about God. And that's probably the, the normal way to come to faith in Jesus. Now, I have heard of times when people, you know, really without much personal contact at all, came into contact with a message about Jesus and put their faith in him. Uh, one of the schools that I taught at before I came to uh, Biblical Seminary of the Philippines, I had a colleague there. And before she came to teach at this uh, Christian seminary, she was teaching in education at a major secular university in the United States. 
She wanted nothing to do with religion or religious people or Christians. One day she was walking across campus and there was some old men, older men passing out little copies of the New Testament. They were from an organization called the Gideons. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Gideons. I know that there are some Gideon organizations in the Philippines as well. But what they do is they pass out copies of the New Testament and of the Bible. And even when I was in a university, I remember receiving a small New Testament from someone in the Gideon's organization. Well, anyways, my colleague was walking across the campus and she didn't want anything to do with these religious fanatics, these crazy people. Uh, and so she looked for a way that she could get past them without actually taking any of their literature and she couldn't find a way. And so as she walked past, one of the older men handed her a small New Testament and, and she didn't know what to do, so she took it, and then she looked for a garbage can that she could throw it away in. And she couldn't find a garbage can, so she just put it in her purse. Well, later that evening, she was emptying out her purse, and she came across that New Testament and just sat down and started to read it. She had never read the Bible before. And it was a New Testament, so she started in Matthew. She told me that when she got to the Sermon on the Mount, and read through the Sermon on the Mount, her heart was so moved. And she thought, if people would really listen to Jesus and, and would obey the things that he was teaching them, the world would be a really different place. And then all of a sudden it hit her, wait a second, if I listened to, to Jesus and followed his teachings in my life, my life would be different. And from that moment, she decided that she would be a follower of Jesus. She went to find a church that would tell her more about what Jesus taught and how she could follow him. Well, that's an unusual story, right? You know, you just kind of almost accidentally come into contact with the Bible and find out about Jesus. Um, that's unusual. Most of us, most of us had someone who really loved God and really loved us and wanted to share the message with us. That was true for me. My parents loved me. They loved God. They loved me. And when I wanted to know about how I could have a relationship with God, I knew that I could go to talk to my dad to ask him about it. And he happily shared the message of Jesus with me and welcomed me into the kingdom, helped me to become a follower of Jesus. And that's important. We don't just share a message. We share our lives. And part of our lives is that we love God and we love others. Well, my next two observations have to do with details in the passage itself. Well, number three here, the Great Commission is all-encompassing, all-encompassing. And the reason why I say that is because when you look at the passage, you'll notice that there are four uses of the word all. Now, the fourth one is a little bit hard to see in an English translation. But there are four uses of the word all, and the Great Commission is all-encompassing. Now, let's look at that passage one more time. All right, as I read through this, you look for the four uses of the word all. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. All right. Did you see them? All authority, all the nations, all that I commanded you. I am with you always, or as it says in the original, all the days to the end of the age. We live under the all-encompassing authority and lordship of Jesus Christ. He is the Lord over all things. He has all authority. He's given us an all-encompassing task to disciple all the nations. Every group of people in the world should have an opportunity to hear about Jesus. Nation here refers to more than something just like modern countries. 
it refers to the various different groups of people, people who have a shared history and culture. Every single group of people should have a chance to hear the message about Jesus Christ. Jesus calls us to an all-encompassing obedience. He wants us to follow everything that he has taught and to share everything he has taught with people so that they might follow him and obey him. And this is not an impossible task to disciple the nations because Jesus has promised to us his all-encompassing help. He's promised to be with us always, all the days to the end of the age. Matthew's gospel is the one that talks about how Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, right? He is God with us. And God is with us because Christ is with us. And we know that if he is with us, he will help us every step of the way. Well, one more observation about the Great Commission. And that is that the Great Commission commands us to make disciples. Perhaps it's not completely obvious in English, but in the Great Commission, there's just one main command, one main command. And that main command is to make disciples. Go and make disciples of all the nations. The main command there is to make disciples. Jesus calls on us to do more than just to share the gospel or more than just to push people to make an initial decision to accept salvation. He wants disciples, people who will identify with him through baptism and people who will learn to obey all that he has commanded. He wants us to to make disciples among every group of people throughout the world. This is what he calls us to, to make disciples. Now, in order to do that, in order to do that, some Christians need to go. Some Christians need to go. So going is not the main command. The main command is to make disciples of all the nations. But going is often a necessary prerequisite to make disciples of all the different people groups of the world. At least some Christians will need to leave a place where they feel at home and feel comfortable, a place where they're close to their family and their friends, and go to another place where, you know, people don't know about Jesus and need to hear about him. They need to be loved and cared for and welcomed into the kingdom of God through a loving, compassionate spokesperson for Jesus. Now, sometimes that going can be from one country, one nation to another nation, one, one, one place in the world to another place in the world. But sometimes that going can be crossing another boundary, an ethnic boundary or a economic boundary or a social boundary. Sometimes you can stay in the same country and still go because you're crossing into a group of people that need to hear the gospel. I have some former students, their husband and wife, they live in, Mal they're from Malaysia. Uh, and after they uh, did their training, they returned back home to Malaysia. They are from a Christian background. They both grew up in Christian families. They're ethnic Chinese, but they have made it their ministry goal to make disciples among ethnic Malays who are predominantly Muslim. That's a boundary, right? That's not an easy boundary to cross. Moving from ethnic Chinese in Malaysia to Muslim Malays in Malaysia in order to reach them for Christ, that's not an easy border to cross. Uh, and so going doesn't necessarily mean going from one country way on the other side of the world to another country. It might mean going down the road, but crossing a boundary of some kind to reach people who don't need, who don't know Christ. And churches need to think about how they can do that well. And I'm grateful that Malibon is willing to seek out and think about how to do that and how to do that well. Well, those are my Four observations. The Great Commission is not a surprise ending. The Great Commission builds on the Great Commandment. The Great Commission is all encompassing. And the Great Commission commands us to make disciples. When we come to the end, 
uh, we'll take some questions. So if you've been thinking of some question that you want to ask, uh, be careful to write them down or send them in the chat area. I'm sure that would be a good way in order to get a question in. Uh, send uh, in the chat area, send a question because we'll try to answer some at the end. Well, I'm, I'm turning it over to my wife, Rebecca, now, and she needs to talk to you a little bit about some of the important ideas and terms related to the history of missions. All right. Hello, it's good to be with you and um, uh, get started. My part of the, our talk this morning is I'm going to be talking a little bit more about the history of missions and what has happened from Matthew 28 and what will be happening that we see prophesied in the book of Revelation. So just a little bit about what I'll be talking about for the next four weeks. So our class or my part of the class is going to look at significant movements and individuals in missions history. And I'm gonna be focusing especially on some of the fascinating stories and contributions of women. Now, if you're a man and you're listening to this, you might be thinking, why are we gonna look at women? And actually there's a very good reason for that. And I will be explaining that in some of my future classes. Uh, sometimes when we read a missionary biography or we hear stories about missions, we just learn all about their wonderful contributions. That's great. But sometimes um, we can also learn a lot by looking at their failures. So we want to celebrate and honor the things that they've done well, but we also want to learn from the things that maybe they didn't do as well and how can we avoid those same mistakes. Um, each class, uh, I want to give you an opportunity for you to consider some practical applications for how you can grow as a world Christian. We don't just want to have ideas in our head. How can this impact us? How can we be more obedient to the Great Commission? So our agenda for our class uh, today is I'm going to look at three things. First, we're going to review some terms that we often hear when we're talking about missions. Um, and then we're going to talk it's about some myths about missions and some ways that we can be cautious. And then finally, I'm going to have some ideas for application. So there's six terms that I'm going to have us look at together. World Christian, Great Commission, Missionary, Missions and Mission, number five, evangelism and discipleship, and finally, six, the creation mandate. And at the end, I'm going to tie all those terms together and see why they make a difference. Well, you might be thinking, why are we going to talk about these terms? I know what a missionary is. I know what the Great Commission is. Interestingly, just this week, I listened to a podcast, uh, and it was several leaders of mission organizations, and they were talking about their vision for the Great Commission. And it was interesting because they had very different ideas of what we should be doing, what we should not be doing. And at the very end, they decided that maybe they just had different definitions for these words, for the language that we use for missions. Uh, and so that's why I think even now it's good for us to have an understanding of what these terms mean. Now, I might be defining these terms a little bit differently than what you've heard. And I think there's some people who are a lot smarter than me that might have different definitions. But as I work through each one of these definitions and tie them together at the end, I hopefully it will help us to understand um, why I'm defining them the way they are. So our first term, world Christian. I don't know if you've heard this before. It's been a term that's been coined sometime in the last few decades. And basically, a world Christian is a day-to-day -day disciple of Christ. And for this person, Christ's global cause is their integrating, overriding priority for all that life is for them. It impacts how they spend their money, where they work, what kind of job they do, how they raise their children. Uh, someone else talked about a world Christian catches the vision, keeps the vision, and obeys the vision. 
When I catch the vision, it means that I understand that making a disciple is just a part of being a Christ follower. I see the world as God sees the world. Uh, and hopefully at some point, as you've been discipled, someone told you that, yes, the Great Commission, that's part of what I need to be doing as well. I need to see the world as God sees the world. And hopefully as you're discipling others or perhaps raising your children, that you communicate to them that making disciples is part of being a Christ follower. Number two, keep the vision. For me, this is the hardest one. We need to understand that being a world Christian is just not short term or part time. Again, it needs to be the overriding priority of my life. Sometimes we get we have a missions moment or we have a missions month at church and we get all excited and enthusiastic. And then after time, you know, our enthusiasm dies down or it weighs, uh, wanes. Um, we want to keep the Great Commission as a priority in our life so that it does impact all our decisions. And number three, to obey. We want to obey the Great Commission. Now, all of us might have different roles in how we obey the Great Commission. We seek the Lord and find out what is my place in obeying the Great Commission. We don't want to be a spectator and just watch others do it. What's my part in being um, a world Christian? So a world Christian sees the world as God sees it, full of people that need to hear the message of salvation. Okay, the next term, Great Commission. And Joel just talked in depth about the Great Commission. So I'm not going to say any more than what he's already shared with us. Um, but the idea is that this is a command that's been given to all Christ followers. Uh, it's not just for a few people. It's for all of us. And once we trust in Christ and have him as our savior of our life and our Lord, the Great Commission becomes our mission. It becomes our purpose in life. And of course, that doesn't mean that we're not gonna have a job and feed our family and raise our children, um, but that this, the Great Commission becomes the focus of what we do and impacts our decisions in life. So world Christians, those whose lives are consumed and centered around the Great Commission, it becomes our purpose in life. Okay, our next term that we're gonna look at is missionary, or sometimes people call it a global Great Commission worker or a global worker. Um, there's been some concern maybe about using the term missionary itself. It can be kind of a problem. There's places in the world that you can't actually get into if you are a missionary. Um, so places like India, you can't come in as a missionary, but you can be perhaps a global worker. Uh, the other problem was sometimes using the term missionary is that it's been tied with colonialism. Uh, and back a couple of hundred years ago, as colonists went out to other places, missionaries, it often opened the door for missionaries. But sometimes there's this uh, difficulty in associating the word missionary with colonialism. So I think it's okay to use other terms that mean this. The main idea that I want us to get from the term missionary is these are ordinary Christ followers, you and me, but they obey the Great Commission in a cross-cultural context. There is a need for global Great Commission workers or missionaries in order to finish the task of reaching those who have not yet heard. There's about 7,000 people groups that have no witness in the gospel, uh, to the gospel. There's no established churches and there needs to be great commission workers who can go over that boundary, cross that boundary, whether it's a language boundary, a geographical boundary, um, a cultural boundary in order to tell those people about Jesus. Um, 
And I think that if we call everybody a missionary, we lose sight of the fact that there are unreached people that need somebody to cross the boundary. I'm gonna read a little bit of a quote from the Global Mission Handbook. And uh, Steve Hoke and Bill Taylor say this, missionary is not simply a generic term for all Christians doing everything the church does in service to the kingdom of God. We do a disservice to the term by universalizing its use, oversimplifying a rich vocabulary and the theology of gifting and vocation. While all believers must be committed to and involved in missions and obeying the Great Commission, not all are missionaries. So they say it's important for us to define this key term and concept. Um, missionaries, these men and women are cross-cultural workers who serve within or outside of their national boundaries, but they are crossing some kind of linguistic, geographical, and cultural barrier in obedience to God. So again, the main thing that I want you to understand about the word missionary and how I define it is it's a Christ follower, someone who obeys the Great Commission, but in a cross-cultural context. Okay, the next term that we're going to look at and kind of comparing a little bit is the term missions and God's mission. So missions or great cultural, uh, global Great Commission work are the tasks of evangelism and discipleship or making disciples, but outside of one's cultural context. So again, it doesn't, as Joel mentioned earlier, it doesn't necessarily mean that you leave your neighborhood or that you have to move to another place in the world, but you're crossing some kind of a cultural boundary in order to make disciples. And missions could include things like building relationships in order for someone to trust you enough for you to be able to share the gospel. It may include learning about culture and language in order to understand the people that you are trying to reach. It may involve Bible translation, church planting, and theological uh, education. So these are some of the, the ways that someone can be doing missions outside of one's cultural context. Um, and I just wanted to mention God's mission. Uh, that's without the S at the end. And basically, God wants to seek and to save the lost wherever they are. Uh, Matthew 24 says, this news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. So God's mission is more encompassing. When I use the word missions, I'm talking about obeying the Great Commission, making disciples outside of one's cultural context. Okay, so now let's talk about missions and evangelism and discipleship. Now, when I get to the end and I tie all this together, this will make more sense. But I am going to use the terms evangelism and discipleship as obeying the Great Commission within your own cultural context, or in other words, our Jerusalem. So I'm still obeying the Great Commission, I'm making disciples, but I'm doing that within my own cultural context. And it could include things like discipling our children, working with the youth program at church, mobilizing others so teaching others how the importance of the great commission and helping them to go inviting a co-worker to church it could be preaching could be theological education but all of that is making disciples within your own cultural context okay so this begs the question why am i making this distinction between missions crossing a cultural barrier and evangelism, doing that within our own cultural context. And the reason I do that is that there are billions of people, about 3 billion people that can only be reached about with the message of the gospel when a Christ follower crosses some kind of cultural and linguistic barrier. 
if we call everything's missions, we lose sight of the fact that there are billions of people who still have not heard about uh, the gospel and the good news of Jesus. Another reason is that um, it, if we uh, make this distinction, it helps us to see that how we use our money really varies very greatly between what we do for missions, going to another cultural context, and evangelism or making disciples in our own cultural context. Of all the money that's given to Christian work, 95% of it goes to our own cultural uh, context. So that leaves less than 5% of all our funds that go to reaching unreached people groups. In fact, more money is stolen from the church than what we give towards cross-cultural missions, which just is kind of mind-blowing that, you know, um, more money is stolen than what we give to reaching the unreached. And so I think if we make this distinction between reaching our own cultural context and making disciples and going outside, uh, it helps us to see some of those differences. Another reason why I make this distinction is it can help to motivate us as world Christians and churches to push towards this goal of every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the Lamb and the throne. So here's this graph that um, I want to look at. Uh, Joel talked uh, earlier about the command, the Great Commission, making disciples in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And the third column there is the goal. Uh, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and the lamb. So we have the, the command on one part and the goal on the other end. And we're in this middle section here, the task. How do we get from the command to the goal? And as missiologists have studied cultures and language, they have come up with about 17,000 different people groups. These are unique cultures where they um, have similarities enough that someone, if they don't know Christ, someone needs to come in to tell them. Otherwise, they don't have the resources to be able to understand that. Out of those 17,000 people groups, there are still 7,000 that are unreached. They're about 41%. They are unreached because these are the difficult places in the world and the difficult peoples in the world to reach. Today, five out of six non-Christians in our world have no hope unless missionaries come to them and plant the church among them. And this is why I make the distinction between evangelism and discipleship in our own culture and missionaries who are in missions crossing a boundary to reach those five out of six non-Christians who have no hope. Okay, there's one more term that I want us to look at, and uh, it's called the creation mandate. Some people, some missiologists and theologians call it the cultural mandate. And basically, this is the idea um, when God created Adam and he put him in the garden, he said, keep the garden. Uh, so people have called this caring for God's creation. Uh, and this is a command that's been given to all of humanity. Um, we also talked about uh, the golden rule, or as Joel mentioned earlier, the, the second part of the great commandment. Uh, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, loving our neighbors as ourselves. Now we find this idea of the golden rule, not only within Christianity, but there are other uh, religious groups that have this idea of um, treating others with dignity. And in fact, if you know anybody who's not, doesn't believe in God at all, even atheists have this idea of um, helping other people. 
I worked for a while at a school teaching refugees and I had to uh, get volunteers to come and help teach. And actually most of the volunteers that would come to help teach English to our refugees were um, what I would call atheists. Um, they had no idea of God, didn't believe in God, but they wanted to help their fellow man. And so the, this idea of caring for God's creation, including uh, people, um, is something that a command that theologians and missiologists say are for all of humanity. And even people who aren't God fearers and other religious groups have this in their heart to care for other people and take care of them. So this is a command that uh, we would say is for all people to obey. It's been given to all of humanity. Now here's some examples of how we can obey the creation mandate or the culture mandate. It could include feeding the hung hungry, caring for widows and orphans, uh, defending those who are treated unjustly, reducing our carbon footprint and being a good steward of Earth's resources. Now, during the pandemic, we've had lots of opportunities to um, carry out the creation mandate. Uh, I've seen um, news from the Philippines and even on some of your Facebook posts, things that you have done to help care for your neighbors who have lost jobs or who have been sick, uh, providing PPE. Uh, and these are all ways that we can obey the creation mandate. But you all know that there's other people who aren't Christ followers who have also tried to help their neighbor during the pandemic. This is a graphic that for me helps put this all together and all these terms together and helps me to make sense of how we are supposed to obey. Uh, the two circles on the top are the creation, or, sorry, the Great Commission mandate the blue circles, the Great Commission mandate. And this is for all Christ followers. I've made the distinction between missions, which is crossing a cultural, a language, some kind of a barrier in order to make disciples. All Christ followers need to be involved with this. Now there are some that go and then the rest of us are supporters. Um, and the goers, I think it does help for them to have some kind of a call or some confirmation from them, especially if they're going to one of those really difficult unreached people groups. But all of us as Christ followers in obeying the Great Commission need to be a part of going or supporting missions, crossing a cultural or language barrier. Now, the other distinction that I make with the Great Commission is evangelism, and I call it evangelism. Uh, it's proclaiming the gospel and making disciples within your own cultural context. That's for all of us, again, all of us. The green circle at the bottom, I'm going to call the cultural man or the creation mandate or cultural mandate. This is for all of humanity. It's caring for God's creation, treating others with dignity and respect, loving our neighbors as ourselves. And we're going to be doing those things regardless of um, uh, what we're going to be, you know, uh, be obeying the Great Commission. Uh, and the one thing to keep in mind with the creation mandate is this is for all of humanity, um, that even a Muslim or an atheist uh, can be fulfilling and living out the creation mandate. Um, One of the problems that I think we can sometimes run into is that if we say that all good works are missions, we can lose the idea that there are lost people who still need to hear the gospel. And I think by keeping these three ideas distinct, um, it can help us think of what we're doing, help us as we are giving towards reaching the unreached people groups, understanding the distinction um, between all of that. Um, okay, let's talk about a few myths. We're gonna change uh, gears just a little bit. We finished talking about terms. Let's talk about some of the myths and I've got three of them listed here. Sometimes we think that 
missionaries are just like these super spiritual elites, you know, they've got this extra um, spirituality that the rest of us don't have. And that's just not true. Uh, missionaries, and if you ask them, they will say, I am just an ordinary Christ follower, but I need a team of people behind me to help and support me through this um, task of obeying the Lord in a cross cultural context. Okay, another myth that we sometimes have is missions work is only for those who are called, that you have to have a specific calling to be involved in missions. And if we go back to our um, previous slide here, uh, we see that missions is for everybody. And not everybody's going to go to an unreached people group, but we're all going to be involved in missions. Uh, we're all called to live out the Great Commission. There is no additional call. As I did say earlier, that if you are have some confirmation or calling from God to go to an unreached people group, I do think that those people have to have some sense that, yes, this is what God is calling me specifically to do and to be obedient to that. But all of us are called to live out the Great Commission and to support that cross-cultural uh, obedience to it. And then another myth that we sometimes have is that missionaries have to have a passport, that you have to go to another place in the world. And Joel had mentioned this earlier as well, that with the, when he was talking about his uh, former students who were in Malaysia, they're still in Malaysia, but they're clearly crossing some kind of a boundary, in this case, a religious boundary in order to share the gospel. Our world has really become a global um, village and people are moving. Well, maybe not so much with the pandemic, but people have been moving around. And so there's many respects in which the, the world has come to our neighborhood. And you may have someone from an unreached people group living in your barangay or working next to you. Um, uh, recently, I was talking to someone who had graduated from BSOP, and they said, uh, next to Fatima Hospital, there are a large population of Hindus who are living there, um, right next to us, and many Hindus are considered an unreached uh, people group. So you don't need to have a passport in order to do cross-cultural missions. You could be a missionary without leaving Manila. Okay, I would like to now transition one more time and we are going to talk about some cautions that we need to be careful of. Sometimes we can view one great commission calling as higher than another's and it kind of ties in a little bit with this myth that missionaries are super spiritual. And really, that's not true. There's not one calling that's more or less honorable than the others. The idea is, are we uh, obeying the Great Commission in the specific way that God wants us to do? There is no one calling that's higher or lower or more honorable than the others. Another caution that I want to mention is, sometimes we can confuse doing good works with missions. Yes, we should all be doing good works. That's part of the creation mandate, uh, loving our brother and sister, caring for God's creation. But again, I think we need to be careful to distinguish between the Great Commission mandate, um, making disciples, and the creation or culture mandate, where we're caring for God's creation and uh, following the golden rule. Sometimes a good way for me to think about that is in making that distinction. Is this something that only a Christian could do? If it's a good work that a Muslim could do, a Hindu could do, an atheist could do, it's probably not missions or Great Commission work. Uh, and so I think that we need to be careful not to call everything missions, because then we lose the sight of the things that only we can do as Christ followers. So be careful not to call everything that we do uh, missions. Is it great commission work? Is it um, 
uh, cultural mandate that anybody could do. One more caution here is that the other side of that, sometimes we can say, I only want to care for people's spiritual or eternal needs. I am going to obey the Great Commission. And sometimes we lose sight of the fact that we are also obligated to uh, obey that, the Great Commandment and to love our neighbor as ourselves. So while only Christ followers can make disciples and obey the Great Commission, we are also commanded to love our neighbor and to care for God's creation. So we can't do one or the other. The idea is that we need to find a balance. Um, yes, the Great Commission is our overriding purpose in life and making disciples, but as human beings, we are also commanded to care for God's creation, and we want to love our neighbor as ourselves. So hopefully, as we've looked at these terms and we've talked about myths and cautions, we can see how some of this all fits together in how we can be obedient to uh, what the Lord has called us to. I'm going to make one more transition here and for our agenda, and that is an application. I don't want us to just hear all these things, and I'm sure uh, the, the leaders at Malibone also just don't want to have uh, classes about missions, but how can we make a change? How can we be more obedient and to grow as a world Christian? Now, I'm going to give you a couple of ideas of things that you can do, or you might have your own idea. And um, after we talk about this, I want you to write down one thing that you can do this week to grow as a world Christian. One I've mentioned is you can download the Operation World app. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And you can pray for the world. You can write an encouraging note to a Christian worker, someone perhaps in your own church or a missionary that you know of. You could order food from an ethnic restaurant and then pray for that country. You could pray for some of the unreached peoples in the Philippines. You could talk about missions with your kids, share some of the terms that we've learned about and um, disciple them in how to obey the Great Commission. You can talk about missions with your Sunday school class or youth group. Look for people in your daily sphere who are not Filipino, who may not be Christ followers and uh, befriend them. Okay, one of the things that you can do this week is download the Operation World app, um, app onto your phone. And every day you can get a um, text from them that um, will give you information about the particular country that they are praying for that day. And they give all kinds of information. Today, the country is Montenegro. It will give you prayer, specific prayer requests, statistics, um, other information that you may want, that you could be interested in. And the other thing that's interesting about the Operation World app is that at the bottom, it will list how many people right now are praying for that place. And you can click and add yourself to that number. So um, Operation World uh, does this by countries, but they do talk about some of the unreached people groups and um, ministries that are in that particular place. So a very easy thing that you can do, uh, downloading that app onto your phone, and then every day you would get a notification for that country and how to pray for that country. So I've given you um, several ideas. Uh, let me see if there's anything else. You could contact some of the min, uh, missionaries at your church and ask them how specifically you could pray for them. Perhaps you could think about some of the myths that we've talked about or cautions that we've talked about and maybe adjust your thinking a little bit. Um, so these are just some of my suggestions, and you might find the Lord or the Holy Spirit speaking to you right now about something specifically that you can do. So what I want you to do is write down one thing that you will do this week to grow as a world Christian.
And our quote for today just really ties all this together. The Great Commission is too big for any one person to accomplish alone, and it's too important not to try together. Well, we are at the time in our uh, talking together this morning for questions. And you may have some questions for Joel. Hopefully you wrote those down. And or if you have some questions for me. And so I am now going to turn this back over to our moderator. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Joel and uh, Mrs. Rebecca Williams for an enlightening talk about uh, the <clears throat> Great Commission. Actually, uh, many people are afraid, uh, even if it's very clear that uh, the Great Commandment, the Great Commission was an order for every believer to make disciples. Uh, Using some of the points that you mentioned earlier, I'd just like to encourage uh, our listeners no? and myself, of course, the three motivation points that I noted down here, that the Great Commission builds on the Great Commandment, as uh, Dr. Williams said, that if we love God and if we care for our neighbors, then why should we be afraid? We have to do whatever was commanded of us so that uh, we have the desire to, to that our neighbors will be saved as well. And uh, number two, then there is a proverb which says that uh, where there is no vision, the people perish. And when uh, Mrs. Williams mentioned about catching the vision and keeping it, keeping the vision and obeying the vision. Maybe instead of being afraid, we just have to obey. And uh, the third point is about the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And when Mrs. Williams mentioned that we can be on our mission wherever we are in our Jerusalem, we don't have to be a missionary who has to go out of the country to reach out to the to the unreachable to other people. We can do it within our circles of uh, family. We can start with family and friends and uh, maybe if we're obedient to God, uh, we can continue on. And uh, there are, I will proceed with some of the questions uh, wait, that were forwarded to me. Uh, there is a question from our listeners. Uh, what are the qualifications and skills that we need to learn to be a global missionary? I think one is just obedience. Um, you know, what is my part in uh, obeying the Great Commission? I think a lot of it is willingness to, to obey God. Um, seeing the world as God sees it. Uh, as far as specific skills, um, I think some of that will just depend on where, if you are crossing some kind of a boundary, um, you know, perhaps you may need to learn a language, but not necessarily. Uh, having a love for that person will clearly make a difference as well. I don't know if there were the question was looking at really specific training or just attitudes of the heart. Mm -hmm. uh, another attitude of the heart that perhaps could be mentioned is humility. Uh, it's so easy to go to some other place or work with people who are different than you and think, oh, well, the way they do it is wrong and our way is so much better and we are so much better than them. And that kind of pride uh, can actually be a barrier to sharing the gospel with people. So humility is an important aspect in recognizing uh, God's gracious work in every culture and every life. So that's another thought that I had. I will go to the next question. Um, would you say that 
missions work in general is hampered from becoming more fruitful because a lot of Christians are content with being sorry with being spectators rather than active spreaders of the gospel. Yeah, in some ways that ties in with what you said at the beginning where, I mean, when you started our question time, uh, you mentioned that sometimes we're fearful to share the gospel with the people around us. And perhaps that makes us less active in trying to disciple people around us or to share the gospel with others. And here's, here's two things that I would give as advice for people who feel um, uninvolved or people who feel fearful. One thing that we said was the Great Commission builds on the Great Commandment. And so one step to becoming involved in reaching the world for Christ is to really love God, spend time with him, spend time in God's word, grow in your relationship with God, and really learn to love other people, uh, to be kind to others around us, to see the needs that people have and recognize ways in which we can be involved in meeting those needs. Um, we can do that. Right. I mean, that that's not something we have to be fearful of. That's not something that we have to feel disengaged with. We really can grow in our love for God. We really can uh, share God's love with others around us. Um, and if we're not doing that, we're not fulfilling what God made us for. Uh, he made us to love him. He made us to love others. So that's, that's one step is if the Great Commission builds on the Great Commandment, learn to love God and learn to love others. That's one good step. Uh, and then the other piece of advice that I would give is uh, sometimes it's really difficult to know how to start conversations um, about, about God and about how to have a relationship with God and what Jesus means to us. Sometimes it's difficult to start those conversations. And I once heard someone give a good piece of advice, so I'll share it with you as well. And the way he said it was, raise the flag and see who salutes. Raise the flag and see who salutes. In other words, just make it part of your daily conversation to talk about how God has blessed you, how grateful you are, what Jesus has done for you. Uh, just make that part of your daily talk where you just think about God's goodness in your life and how, how grateful you are that God loves you. And then just wait and see who takes you up on that conversation. Uh, you're not trying to force anybody to listen to you. You're not attacking people and telling them to be quiet while you share the gospel. Just, you know, you raise the flag, use your conversation to say things about the goodness of God in your life and then see who shows interest. Who wants to talk to you about that? And that will open up opportunities. And you don't have to feel pressure about that. You can just pray and ask God to open up opportunities. But make uh, your relationship of God, with God a part of, your, part of your talk and then see who expresses interest. So love God and love others. Be quick to talk about what God has done for you and see who wants to talk to you about that. So those would be two pieces of advice for me. Uh, there is a follow-up question, or is it, or is it just by God's design that most will stay where they they are, and only a small percentage of Christians will cross boundaries? Is that just okay? Because if everyone were to cross boundaries, it might be a big mess. Or will the Great Commission, or or will the Great Commission work benefit much if more Christians would go and cross boundaries? There are times that I think because the world has become this global village that there could be people from an unreached people group in your neighborhood and where you work. Uh, and so we're not necessarily um, 
going to a very remote place or place that's going to be very different than our own. So we can be crossing a boundary and doing missions work, um, befriending people from another cultural group right where we are. Uh, but there are the people that will need to cross a, a boundary to actually go. Um, and I think that if we look at what's being done, when we look at um, the unreached people groups, there's some excellent resources there that someone who's going to cross, uh, be a, a missionary to an unreached people group, uh, they're typically not going to just get on a plane and go somewhere. They're probably going to be a part of a mission agency and a church is going to be a part of them. So it's probably going to be a little bit less chaotic than perhaps it sounds like. Um, and let me just give you one example of how that can be true. Our home church here in the United States has caught the vision for the unreached people groups, the 7,000 distinct cultural groups that still don't have the gospel. And they decided to adopt two of those people groups. So a portion of the missions budget from our church is going to missions work in those two people groups. Now, there, there are two people groups in uh, the, the continent of Africa, and they are actually supporting a missionary who is African in a neighboring country, uh, two missionaries that will be going in and reaching that, those particular people groups. And then regularly, the church will send some short-term teams over uh, to help with that work. So in other words, if we're looking at how can we uh, make this less chaotic, I think if you go through the process, if you feel the sense that perhaps God is calling me to an unreached people group, that you would uh, get leadership and guidance from your church, that you would probably be a part of a mission agency, and that that will help um, make things less chaotic. Does that help answer that question? Or did you? Yeah, I guess when I'm asked questions like that, I go back and I look at the example of the Apostle Paul, because he seems like he's the exemplary missionary of the Bible. And when Paul went to a particular city, he shared the gospel, he gathered people into a church, and then he left and went to the next city. And I think he assumed that most of the people who came to faith in Jesus we're going to stay in Ephesus, where he had started the church, to share the gospel with the people in that city and the surrounding area. So he went from major city to major city, and I think he assumed that the normal pattern would be for people to stay where they were and to reach their friends and family and then think about how the neighboring areas could be reached as well. But Paul also picked up a Timothy, and he picked up other people along the way and encouraged them to become missionaries and to travel. And we know of others that he encouraged that didn't travel with him, but went and did missions elsewhere. So I think the question asked, is it normal for most people to stay where they are and try to reach people and their friends and family where they are? I think that's the normal biblical pattern. Uh, but all along the way, there are people who feel called by God, who are encouraged by church leaders to, to consider missionary work, feel themselves to be called for this, and their church leaders confirm that in their life. There has to be some who are willing to go and to cross a boundary to reach others. But it's not... I. I can remember growing up feeling guilty every time a missionary came if I thought, well, I'm not a missionary right now, I should feel guilty. Uh, you know, I, don't, I don't think people should feel guilty about that. That's the normal pattern for people to flourish and to love God and to love others right where God has placed them. Um, so I think that seems to be somewhat of the example of the Apostle Paul, if that helps. Uh, may, maybe we, we just have to be uh, sensitive to the Spirit's uh, leading, if we have the gift and the calling. Uh, we and, can share. We have to be obedient <laughs> enough. <laughs> and we, uh, just as a 
as we share our brief testimony, before we met and were married, we both individually felt God's call to um, be obedient to the God in a cross-cultural context. And so we were both planning in that direction, preparing. We met, we got married, and then together we were planning in that direction. And then God led us in a very different direction. Uh, and so for what, t close to 30 years, we were actually uh, serving in the United States, doing obedience to the Great Commission um, in the United States uh, within our own cultural group. But part of what we did was mobilize others, discipling others and training others so that they could be missionaries. And at various points during those 30 years, you know, uh, we would ask the Lord, you know, do you still want us here? Is there something else that we should be doing? And, you know, it was always like, nope, I've got you right where you want. And then about four or five years ago, uh, you know, again, we came to the Lord, you know, are we still supposed to be here? Are we supposed to go? Um, and this time the Lord said, yep, I want you to go and open the door. And lo and behold, here we are in the Philippines. Um, so the Lord can change his calling on your life uh, at different points as well. So I think it's important as we, how are we supposed to obey the Great Commission? Um, yes, most people end up staying in their own cultural context. Uh, but the Lord could call you to a cross-cultural context and leaving the comfort of your own home and go to another place at different seasons of your life. So when we talk about um, obeying uh, as a world Christian, come to the Lord at, you know, at various points or at regular points during your life, times of transition and see, perhaps God wants me to obey him in a different way um, in the future. Yeah, I mean, that's just a good point. Um, we had both dreamed of doing some kind of uh, teaching work outside the United States. We had dreamed about that, but the Lord had us in the United States for decades. And then when the Lord finally opened the door for us to be able to go and teach at BSOP and serve in the Philippines, it was a dream come true for us. We, we are just, we were just so happy after those years to be able to finally uh, end up in the Philippines. And we are so disappointed <laughs> that, that we are back here and we would rather be there with you. So, um, but I, mean, I just wanted to make that point clear. It's like, we don't, we have never felt like, oh, we go to the Philippines, how hard this is for, for us, it's just a dream come true uh, to be able to do that. There's another question here. Um, perhaps some Christians have the mindset that since they themselves are saved, then there really is not a lot of incentive for them to spread the gospel because they're in the safe zone already. Does the Bible say what will happen to Christians who do not take the Great Commission seriously? Um. Well, the Bible does say that we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for our life. I mean, that, that is part of what will happen. Someday we'll stand before Christ to explain to him why we lived our life the way that we did. And I don't think that has to do with um, whether or not you'll go to heaven or be with the Lord forever. Um, that was solved at the cross, right? Jesus died for us. We put our faith in him. I understand that. But that's a fearful thing to think about standing before Jesus and explaining to him why you lived your life the way that you did. And I want to be able to stand before him and say, I, I live my life in a way that I cared about the things that you care about, Lord. And, and wouldn't it be wonderful to have him say, well done, good and faithful servant. I mean, that would be a wonderful thing. But a fearful thing to think that I've wasted my life and I didn't really live it for eternity and to have to explain that to Jesus someday. So there, there is that, there is a moment of reckoning where we stand before Christ to explain our life. 
the other thing that I would add is that part of um, the, the Great Commission talks about teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And I think part of that whole discipleship process is teaching people uh, about the Great Commission and that it's all of our responsibility, not as a way to make people feel guilty, um, but it's just part of how uh, God sees the world. If we want to be Christ followers, we also want to see the world as God sees it and have the same burden for the world. So I think it's part of the discipleship process. If we have someone who feels like, ah, you know, I'm not concerned about that, perhaps then it's our responsibility to teach them that this is actually important to the Lord and we all have a part, um, again, not to make someone feel guilty, but there is a real joy in um, sharing the gospel with people and obeying the Great Commission. Um, and so just that's part of the discipleship process, sharing that uh, uh, the, the importance of the Great Commission um, with, with others so they can understand. Yeah, I guess uh, we really have to take the responsibility to, to uh, be disciples of uh, whether in our respective uh, spheres of influence or outside. Because if we do not follow it, uh, we have to be accountable to God in the end. Uh, there's another question again. Uh, here's... Uh, can one be a missionary without being sent by a specific church? I think that um, if, if we define missions and missionary as someone who obeys the Great Commission in another cultural context, we can do that without um, uh, leaving our country or our community. If we are uh, reaching someone evangelizing befriending someone who's in another cultural group but they live in our neighborhood perhaps or our barangay or where we work uh, that's someone that doesn't have to be sent by a church you're doing that within your own um, neighborhood per se or your own workplace so that person doesn't need to have a ascending church per se um, I think it helps that if you can let your perhaps Sunday school class know that they can be praying for you as you're doing that. Um, I think that if you are going to uh, another cultural context, uh, moving to another place where it's perhaps another place in the Philippines or even another place in the world, I think it helps to have um, a group that's supporting you. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a mission agency, but mission agencies are created uh, with that kind of support in place. Um, someone who goes uh, needs a support team behind them, so people to pray for them, perhaps to help them uh, with financial support, um, logistic kinds of things. And so mission agencies are built to provide that kind of support. Um, there's perhaps other ways of doing it. Um, and so maybe a church is willing to provide that kind of logistic support for someone going. But when someone goes to another place without that kind of support, um, you know, missions work is tough. I mean, you're on the front lines of this battle between um, the Lord's work and uh, uh, Satan and the forces of evil, we need that person to be supported. So that would be my response to that. Okay, I think that's the last question for today. It's already almost time. Thank you once again, uh, Dr. and Mrs. Williams, for your availability to teach uh, UECM and our members regarding uh, missions, especially September is our missions month. And uh, we'd like to remind everyone, uh, the second session will be on uh, next Saturday, same time, 8 o'clock to 9.30 p.m. And uh, we would like to end this 
by inviting another missionary uh, to give us our closing prayer. Their family, uh, they heeded the call uh, to reach out to uh, far flung area, uh, to far away place. And uh, uh, let's invite um, our brother Zeus to uh, give our closing prayer. Okay, let's pray. Um, thank you, Lord, for giving us uh, time for us to learn more about mission. And thank you, Lord, for all the, um, the lessons that uh, the terms, the clarification of the terms. And, um, and wow, there's so many people yet haven't heard your, um, your gospel. 7,000 plus, Lord. We just want to pray for them that you will uh, send more people, Lord, to, to these uh, 7,000 plus uh, ethnic groups who haven't heard your, your, your word. But Lord, you, are, you know what is best for us. Uh, you know what are the steps that we, we should do. And Lord, there's a lot of things going on, uh, training pastors, Lord, uh, to be um, to uh, about concentrating more on discipleship, Lord. Uh, there's more churches that uh, is working together, Lord, in um, in grouping people, Lord, uh, and seeing the importance of mission, Lord. We just want to lift up. Uh, praise and honor, Lord, because you, these are all your leadings. Lord, we just want to pray for our missionary um, edges and G Lord, um, Lord, they are here, cannot go to um, their place because of uh, uh, the lockdown. Lord, and thank you, Lord, that during this time, uh, G can also uh, be helped in her uh, help and also joy lord who who has improved a lot uh, in their in their health lord we we thank you lord uh, we pray that um, continue to heal them in their um, sickness and uh, help us lord to learn how to care for them and lord we also want to pray for the people in afghan lord we heard of so many scary things that is happening to the um, uh, to the churches, Lord, uh, Lord, they, they have killed a lot of uh, house churches and they, they are so uh, brave to face uh, their death. Lord, help us, Lord, uh, to, to pray for them and to care for them. Uh, especially during this time of um, the, the takeover of the Taliban. Lord, we just uh, want to continue that uh, you give us, Lord, the burden um, uh, in, in not only in uh, knowing, but also applying uh, what we have learned. Help us, Lord, that the church will be um, increase their uh, our support, Lord, for the missions, Lord, that, that um, to see the importance of giving to the mission field. Thank you. Uh, we pray that we can learn more about um, uh, missions of the coming um, Saturdays. Continue to bless um, uh, Dr. Joel and uh, Mrs. Uh, Williams, Lord, we pray that you will continue to uh, give them the uh, your Holy Spirit, Lord, to, to teach us um, every Saturday until end of uh, September. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Uh, again, uh... Hope to see everyone again uh, next uh, Saturday, uh, same time, 8, 8 to 9.30 p.m. Thank you and have a good day.